Chapter 1 Christmas Eve Crash Clyde Peters is dead. The low, gravely voiced of Peru's leading news commentator, Juan Ramirez Lazo, bellowed out on the evening news. This is the latest tragedy in connection with the loss of Lanza Airline Flight 508, the crash in the Amazon jungle 12 days ago. After learning that a 17 year old girl survived and reached a woodcutter's cabin 11 days after the accident, North American missionary Clyde Peters parachuted into the crash site to search for more survivors. He hasn't been heard from and is presumed dead. The news hit like a bolt of lightning. How can Clyde be dead, I asked myself. He's the first full-time Seventh-day Adventist missionary pilot, flying the mission plane, Fernando Stow. He takes God's love and last day three angels' message to remote tribes in the upper Amazon jungle. And he's a jump master with nearly 800 jumps recorded in his parachute logbook. Tormented by questions without answers, I paced the floor while sharp pain stabbed the pit of my stomach. Why would God allow Clyde to die during an attempt to save human life? Why should a missionary's wife like Eleanor have to suffer the loss of her husband? What would the three Peters' children, Shelley, Alan, and Linda, do without a father? On Christmas Eve, Clyde Peters lay in bed burning with fever from a bout with hepatitis. Unable to fly for more than a week, his condition seemed to grow worse. He had no way to know the events earlier that day would plunge him into the greatest predicament of his life. Before noon on December 24th, Julianne Kopeck, blonde, barely 5 feet tall, weighing 90 pounds, boarded Lanza Flight 508, headed for the Peruvian city of Pacalpa. The only child of German scientists, she had just graduated from high school in Lima, Peru. She buckled up in a window seat in the third row from the back on the right side of the plane. Her mother, Dr. Marie Kopecki, an orthodontist, sat beside her. Dr. Marie had recently completed bird drawings for a series of Peruvian stamps. She had delivered her artwork in Lima, attending her daughter's graduation, and was now flying home with the girl for holidays. They would join husband and father, Dr. Hans Kopecki, an ecologist who studied Amazon wildlife. The airliner climbed to 24,000 feet and leveled off. Julian gazed at the snow-covered Andes and peaks reflecting the late morning sun like giant diamonds. Turning to her mother, she said, I can't wait to get home to spend Christmas Eve with you and Daddy. Now that you're finished with high school, what are your plans for college? Her mother questioned. Mom, I've decided to follow your example and study biology. A haughty atmosphere permeated the plane. Since the school year in Peru begins in April and ends in December, most of the passengers were students heading home for the holidays in the jungle. They carried gifts for their parents, brothers, and sisters. Talking and laughter flooded the cabin as everyone anticipated the joy of joining their families at the end of the flight. After serving snacks, three stewardesses entered the cockpit and started flirting with the pilots. Conversation focused on the crew's Christmas Eve party, scheduled for the return to Lima. Our wives may get a little jealous when they see us dancing and drinking with pretty stewardesses, one of the men joked. The plane descended to 18,000 feet. Shortly after 12 noon, Captain Carlos Forno radio traffic control. Estimated arrival in Pacalpa is 12.47 p.m. A huge black cloud climbed high in their flight path. Jerry Vegas, co-pilot, shouted at the captain, Are you going into this? Of course, the pilot, irritated being questioned, flew straight ahead into the storm. Heavy rain pounded the plane. The flight crew joked when two stewardesses left. Fasten seatbelt signs flashed on. Captain Forno called for a reduction in power and reported leaving 18,000 feet. Stewardess Dory Small, still in the cockpit when the plane lurched ahead in terrible turbulence, screamed, I'm going back to the cabin! No, the pilot commanded. Stay where you are and hang on! Back in the tail section, Julian clung to her mother's arms as she watched huge drops of rain beat against the window. A flash of lightning hit the edge of a wing. Baggage flew out of the overhead racks. A woman screamed. Julian braced herself when the yellow flame leaped across the right wing. Her mother cried, This is the end of everything! Then a violent explosion shook the plane. A noisy crowd waited at the Papilia Airport from the 1 p.m. arrival of Lands of Flight 508. Excited families eager to celebrate, prepared to welcome relatives and friends home for Christmas Eve. Since changing weather often delayed jungle flights, no one showed concern when the plane had not arrived to by 1.15 p.m. By 2, a rumor circulated that instead of landing in Papilia, the plane had flown on to Iquitos, bypassing a severe storm. Some Lands Airline employees hauled out a bulletin board and posted a notice. Official communication, Lanza Flight 508 left Lima at 11.38 a.m. The pilot radio from over Oyen at 12.09 p.m. estimating arrival in Papilia at 12.47 p.m. The Christmas Eve spirit in the rustic terminal instantly vanished. Eager anticipation turned to anxiety as parents and spouses pressed Lanza agents for more information. All the employees could say was that they didn't know anything. Finally, weary agents closed their doors and refused to talk. The mayor at Papilia, his face drawn, waited with the others. My two daughters are on the missing plane, he said. Now without the arrival of Flight 508, this could be the worst Christmas in the history of our city. 
Perplexed people pound in vain on the doors at Lanza's office. Finally, they headed home, walking as if in a funeral procession. Early that evening, and unaware of Julian and the Lanza flight, the Peters children crowded around Clyde's bed for worship. Eleanor, sitting near her husband, led them in singing carols. The sounds of Silent Night and other favorite drifted out into the warm tropical night. They read from God's word and talked about the gift of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, a Jesus who came to save his people from their sins. The children prayed that their father would get well soon. Clyde, exhausted from the hepatitis, fell asleep early. At 7 a.m. on December 25th, a loud knock on the front door awakened him. Eleanor led David Algular into their bedroom. Sorry to disturb you so early on Christmas morning, he said. It's all right, Clyde responded. Tears filled David's eyes as he spoke. Lens Airline Flight 508 with 92 people on board failed to arrive yesterday and is reported missing. Commander Manuel DiCaprio is calling for every available airplane to join the search for the missing airliner. Minutes later, Stan Sorenberger charged in with more details. Five Baptist missionaries were passengers on the missing plane, including a teenager named Nathan Lyons. In spite of his weakened condition, after long days in bed with hepatitis, Clyde forced himself to sit up and start dressing. I've got to help find the lost plane, he explained to his reluctant family. I'm praying for survivors, and they will need help. Calling student missionary Dan Winberg, Clyde rushed to the hangar to inspect the mission plane, check the oil, and fuel up. You know, Dan, Clyde confided, 14-year-old Nathan is on that plane. He's about the age of my son, Alan. That boy's fascinated with parachutes, and every time I've jumped, he's been there. His father's a real friend who's helped me many times. Clyde grabbed a couple of parachutes and flew to the Papilia Airport. There, Commander Del Caprio, Chief Search Coordinator, marked areas on his map for him to patrol. With Dan and two other men in his plane to help observe, he began combing the jungle for signs of a crash. As each weary hour passed, Clyde realized more fully that the task of spotting a lost airliner in the immense jungle below would be next to impossible. A sinking sun cast long shadows across the dirt runway when he landed back at the Avenus Air Base. Exhausted, Clyde climbed out of his plane and stumbled back to his house. Eleanor hugged her tired husband and after serving him a good meal, put him to bed. Today I read an article in Life and Health magazine describing a treatment for infectious hepatitis. She commented, I want to give it a try. She followed the recommendations for hot and cold compresses over the liver area. The hydrotherapy began to relieve Clyde's discomfort. She slept all night and gave him another treatment in the next morning. Before flying out, he smiled at her. You're the best wife in the world. I can't believe something as simple as hot and cold water can make me feel so much better. He kept searching, though every four or five hours, he would fly home where Eleanor could give him another treatment. Then feeling better, he would take off again. Each day his health improved. Thank you, Lord, he prayed. But why does the day end without any sign of the lands of plane? So after seven days, the Peruvian Air Force called off the search. Because of the German embassy in Limbo wanted Dr. Hans Kopak to get their official word that his wife, Marie and daughter Julian, were on the missing plane. Clyde flew to the jungle farm where Dr. Kopak conducted scientific studies. Peters tried to encourage the scientists. Until the plane is found, there's still hope for survivors, he suggested. The scientists snarled at the idea of finding anyone alive. The plane crashed. My wife and daughter are dead. That's it. You can believe as you wish, doctor, but I'm praying survivors will be found. Even though the search was officially ended, I'll keep on looking. Clyde waved as the mission plane lifted off the jungle farm. No one knew that four days later, Dr. Kopeck would get the surprise of his life. After hearing a terrible explosion on the Christmas Eve flight, Julian watched the rear right wing rip away from the plane at about 10,000 feet elevation. Seconds later, she found herself flying outside the plane, still strapped to her seat. As she tumbled, twisted and twirled, flying at 120 miles an hour, she asked herself, am I dreaming? Can this be real? Far below, she saw jungle treetops. They looked like cauliflowers, she thought. Her eyes watered as wind swished by, blurring her vision. Everything went black. When she awoke, she hung upside down, still strapped in the triple seat. The two seats next to her were empty. There was no sign of her mother or the other passenger. She looked at her watch. Four o'clock. Three hours had passed since the airliner disintegrated in a violent thunderstorm. The only sounds now were the croaking frogs and pouring rain. Miraculously, the branches of the tall jungle trees broke her fall. One swollen eye made it difficult to see. She felt a bump on her head and saw a gash on one foot. In addition, she had cut on her right arm and a broken collarbone, yet she felt no pain. Although she managed to unbuckle her seatbelt and get to the ground, she didn't have enough energy to leave the area of the trees. Suffering shock and half asleep, she spent the whole night lying under the seat, trying to protect herself from the heavy rain. The next morning, Julian awoke to the songs of jungle birds. Huge green trees screened the sunlight. Slowly, she crawled out from under the seats. After taking a few steps, she found a small package and opened it. It contained fruitcake and hard candy. When she bit into the fruitcake soaked from rain, it tasted terrible and she threw it away, but took the wrap candy, hoping to avoid the poisonous snakes. 
She picked up a long stick to probe around the ground covered with vegetation. During her years living with her parents in the jungle, she learned that it's not the big animals such as jaguars that are dangerous, it's the small ones. Snakes, spiders, poisonous insects, and perhaps worst of all, malaria infested mosquitoes. Poking along with her stick, she looked for her mother. What's wrong with me? Feeling dizzy, she stopped to rest. Mother! Mother! She called. No one answered. Then she followed a swarm of flies to a row of airplane seats. Flies buzzed around the motionless bodies of three girls, still held by their seatbelts. Sickened by the scene of death, Julian moved on. After searching for hours, she stopped dead still. What's that? She listened to the gentle sound of a small stream and remembered the words of her parents. Julian, if you ever get lost in the jungle, find a stream and follow it. It will lead you to a larger stream. Rivers are the roads for Indians and plantation people who live along the banks. Eventually, you'll get back to civilization. She understood some of the hazards of traveling jungle waterways. Rivers meander around so much that one can go for hours and advance only a few hundred yards. Piranhas, fish with razor-like teeth, could be attracted by the blood from the gash on her foot and tear away her flesh in seconds. At night, millions of malaria-infested mosquitoes swarm the riverbanks. Julian had boarded the plane wearing white shoes with high heels. One was gone when she woke up on the jungle floor, and she had thrown the other one away. Barefoot, she tried to follow the riverbank, but the thick tangle of jungle vines made each step difficult. Often, she had to wade in the water. At night, bloodthirsty mosquitoes attacked her. The itching from hundreds of bites made sleep impossible. In the daytime, large flies kept stinging and laying eggs in the open sores on her arm and foot. Occasionally, she heard aircraft engine thought, They're searching for the plane! She knew they could never see her through the dense canopy of jungle trees. Yet she looked up and screamed, Hello! Help! Help! Soon the sound of engines would fade away. I'm all alone again, but I can't get discouraged. At least I've been able to find a small stream of clear water to drink, and I don't feel hungry. On the third day, vultures circled overhead, and she guessed they indicated the presence of dead bodies in the area. Stumbling to a piece of plain fuselage, she found no sign of survivors. Baked by suffocating jungle heat, she staggered on. The river widened, and even though she feared being eaten by piranhas, she risked swimming whenever possible. Trying to sleep in wet clothes at night, she listened to the haunting sounds of predators in search of a meal. Finally, on the fourth day, she ate the last of her candy and considered eating some toads, but decided against it. She resisted eating wild fruit since many jungle plants are poisonous. Seeing maggots crawling in her wounds, she imagined, I'm being eaten alive! The eggs laid by flies were beginning to hatch. The river grew wider and wilder. Julian swam more often, always trying to avoid log jams, rapids, and whirlpools. Each time it looked safe ahead, she swam. When she tried to walk, the loss of energy from lack of food, sleepless nights, and humid heat brought pain to each bare footstep. Late on the tenth day, she caught sight of a dugout canoe tied to a tree in front of her. Someone lives here! She wanted to shout, limping along a narrow path. She reached a small, weather-beaten thatch hut. Hello! Hello! She called. Although she received no response, the door stood open. Entering cautiously, she found a small outboard motor and a can of gasoline sitting on the rough wood floor. Wonderful! People do live here! I hope they come back soon! As she collapsed on the floor, she wondered, what will happen if the owners come back and find me asleep? Screaming parakeets and howler monkeys didn't keep her from falling asleep, though. When she awoke in the morning to the sound of a torrential rain, her first thought was about the canoe. I could take it and go down the river. No, that's stealing, and I've never stolen anything in my life. While waiting inside, the dimly lit hut from the rain to stop, she took a sliver of palm wood and carefully extracted 11 maggots from her infected sore. Voices! I hear voices! Three men rushed in out of the rain. Seeing the blonde teenage girl with short hair and bangs, they stopped in shock. One asked in Spanish, What do we have here? The muscular mestizos, a mixture of Indian and Spanish, worked as woodcutters, but had gone on to hunt. They knew about the airplane crash and listened to Julian's story. Gently, they poured kerosene over her infected wound and extracted another 30 wiggly maggots. Knowing the girl had to be hungry, they prepared food and offered it to her. She couldn't eat at first and laughed. I guess my stomach shrunk. As soon as the rain let up, the men helped Julian into the canoe, attached the motor, and took her down to Shabonia River. She watched the river grow wider, swifter, and more dangerous. Could I have made this by myself? She wondered as the canoe descended wild rapids and dodged whirlpools. Several hours later, they beached the canoe at the Amazon settlement of Torvincia. The staff of the small clinic checked her bloodshot eyes and swollen face. They treated the open lesions on her arms and legs, where 41 worms had been removed. They then arranged for a small plane to fly her to the Summer Institute of Logistics base at Yurin Kocha, where an American missionary doctor could treat her. After falling 10,000 feet from an exploding plane, 17-year-old Julian had walked 10 days alone in the jungle. On the 11th day, kind woodcutters took her back to civilization. At the base, she asked for a Bible. Why am I alive, she wondered. What plans does God have for me? Why did so many others die? 
News of his daughter's arrival reached Dr. Kopecki. Clyde, completing 11 days of searching, arrived back at the base. Hearing as Julian had walked out of the jungle alive, he rushed over to the logistics base for a visit. He found the girl distressed at the loss of her mother, but absolutely delighted to be with her father. Dr. Kopeck, who four days earlier declared that there was no hope, stood with his arms around his daughter. What do you think of a brave girl who survives a Christmas Eve crash and then walks alone for ten torturous days in the wild jungle? He asked Clyde. I think she's great, doctor, and if there's one survivor, there may be more. I'll do anything to find anyone still alive and needing help. The next morning at 5.30, Clyde flew to Puerto Inca with two parachutes in the back of his plane. The authorities were organizing a new search and a Peruvian Air Force helicopter stood by. More planes arrived and the pilots studied their maps. With information from Julian, they quickly pinpointed the crash site to an area of about 20 square miles. The pilots wanted to find the wreckage as soon as possible. Clyde approached Commander Manuel DiCaprio. If this girl walked away from the crash, there must be more people who are still alive. Commander Del Caprio nodded. Yes, I've been thinking the same. If we could get in right away and cut down some trees, helicopter could land. We might find 20 or 30 people still alive. The officer shook his head. There's no way we can do that. We don't have anyone prepared to jump into the jungle. I can't quite volunteer. I've got all the equipment in the back of my plane right now. Really? If that's the case, why don't you get ready? We'll have you jump just as soon as we can get word on the location of the crash. Racing back to his plane, Clyde pulled out his parachute and all the other equipment he would need except for a chainsaw. Borrowing a brand new one, he promised to return it before the day was over. Then he spent an hour getting everything tied to his parachute harness. Less than two weeks had passed since he had left his sick bed with hepatitis. After wearing 200 pounds of equipment for 30 minutes, he felt extremely tired and took it off. The authorities advised the search planes that Peter should be ready to jump as soon as they spotted the wrecked plane. While waiting, Clyde talked with the helicopter pilot and finalized on the signals they would use. A plane landed and a pilot ran up. You'd better hurry, Clyde. I just spotted the Lanza crash. The jungle hides it so well you barely see it. Grab your equipment and I'll go with you in the helicopter. Peters considered running back to his plane to pick up the compass he had left. Oh well, I won't need it, he thought. I'll cut down a few trees, the helicopter will land, and I'll be back in time for lunch. He buckled his parachute harness. A provisional knot would hold the chainsaw by his side until after the parachute opened. Then he would untie it and release a coil of rope, allowing the saw to drop below him so it would hit the ground first and not injure him. He climbed into the Aluchi helicopter with the chainsaw on his left, a large duffel bag on his right, and other items strung over his body. The craft lifted off on a heading of 285 degrees. A United States Air Force Hercules C-130, flown in from Panama, fixed a scope on the wrecked plane and circled around it. The helicopter pilot followed its instructions. Go right, turn left, you passed it, turn around and come back. In spite of the help of the C-130's technology, the helicopter circled 15 minutes before they actually saw the wreckage hidden beneath the vast canopy of green jungle. The chopper climbed to 3,000 feet. The second time around, Clyde prepared to jump, but lost sight of the debris and asked the pilot to circle again. The third time around, he spotted the wreckage, but it disappeared before he could crawl out of the open door. Confident of the exact crash location, he jumped anyway. Slowly counting to five, he pulled his ripcord. The candy strip parachute opened with a jerk. As it did, the chainsaw on his side slipped away from his line dropping like an arrow toward the dense jungle below. Continue listening.